Good morning, everyone. Could I have your attention? If you could all make your way to your seats, that would be lovely. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the City of Adelaide hosted uh, the, for the Seat of Adelaide Election Candidate Forum. Uh, this morning, we're going to meet all of the candidates uh, for the Seat of Adelaide. And equally as importantly, we're here to hear your questions. And this is a fabulous opportunity for you to ask questions of any or all of the candidates, and we'll uh, explain how that process will get underway. Before we begin this morning, the City of Adelaide acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, their beliefs and their relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. So as I said, we're all here today to hear from the candidates and representatives running in the federal seat of Adelaide. You'll also get a chance to ask any questions, so please, I, I do encourage you to think about those before we get to the uh, end of the breakfast. The people you'll be hearing from today, and I should stress that this is the order that they are on the ballot paper, so we will follow the same order. You'll hear from Chris James of the Australian Democrats, Barbara Pocock of the Greens, Steve Georgianis of the Australian Labor Party, Deanna Kangas of the Animal Justice Party, Sean Osborn of the Liberal Party, and Antonio Reid from the United Australia Party. A very special welcome, of course, to the uh, Lord Mayor of Adelaide, Sandy Vashaw, who is hosting us in this fabulous historic town hall. I'd also like to acknowledge a few other special guests that we have in the room today. City of Adelaide Deputy Lord Mayor Hussam Abiyad, City of Adelaide Councils, uh, Councillors, rather, Abra oh, I'm, apologies, I'm stumbling over that, Abraham Zeda, Kouros, Donovan, Howe, Noel, Martin and Sims, my apologies, Councillor, City of Adelaide CEO Mark Goldstone, the Honourable Rachel Sanderson, MP, the State Member for Adelaide, City of Prospect Mayor David O'Loughlin and Deputy Mayor Matt Larwood, City of West Torrens Councillors Dominique McGarvin and Simon Sapsiris, and reps or representatives from a range of community, resident and business groups. Now, in the highly unlikely event of an emergency, you will hear an alarm sound. Please remain calm and follow the instructions of the catering and council staff in the room, and please evacuate to Flinders Street. I would now like to welcome the Lord Mayor of the City of Adelaide to speak to you about her vision for our city. Would you please welcome the Lord Mayor? Good morning, everybody. Mani na pudni. Welcome to all. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pay my respects to elders past and present. And we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. Um, thank you to Lee McCloskey for being our MC today, to the candidates, uh, to my fellow councillors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the City of Adelaide, I do thank you all for getting up so early to join us today uh, to hear from the candidates standing for election to represent the federal seat of Adelaide. The town hall meeting is one of the most widely recognised symbols of direct democracy and community engagement and it's been prevalent through the ages and is as important today as it has ever been. Today's event is an opportunity to hear about the policy positions and priorities from six candidates and the parties they represent standing for election for the federal seat of Adelaide. It's also an opportunity to discuss matters and have questions answered that are of direct importance to you, the voters. The federal seat of Adelaide takes in many diverse at, uh, areas from the cities of Adelaide, Prospect, Walkerville, as well as parts of Burnside, Charles Sturt, Port Adelaide, Enfield, Unley and West Torrens. Beyond growing the economy and improving the livability for residents, workers and visitors, the City of Adelaide has several priorities uh, that we hope to be addressed during this campaign. Firstly, the extension of the tram network and improving public transport. We hope to see policies which encourage population growth and skilled migration. We look for a focus on measures to increase innovation and sustainability and better support for our homeless and our most vulnerable. When it comes to the extension of Adelaide's tram network, this remains a priority initiative with a five to ten year time frame for implementation. Council supports an immediate focus 
on a city loop and expansion to the inner northern suburbs via O'Connell Street, North Adelaide. These projects would connect key destinations to the CBD and support much needed economic growth for key business corridors. Investment in trams or similar technologies would catalyse construction and permanent jobs, encourage, encourage residential, commercial and private developments and increase pedestrian activity on our streets, all of which provides significant economic uh, uplift. And of course, as you would have heard me speak several times, there are other technologies that I hope that we explore over the next few years, including the trackless trams. Adelaide is one of the top 10 most visible cities in the world. And Council wants to see our population grow sustainably by attracting more residents and more workers to the city. Attracting new skilled migrants to Adelaide and supporting graduating international students to remain to support our emerging and growing industry sectors are policies that are important to the future of our state. Ensuring affordable housing is also vital to achieving these goals. South Australia has a strong reputation for innovation and sustainability. It has led to new industries in emerging global sectors and the redevelopment of Lot 14, a focus of the recently signed City Deal, which will be a key feature of our city's future. We'd like to see South Australia positioned as a hub for renewable energy storage, waste resource recovery and zero carbon industries. Additionally, we'd like to hear about policies on the transition to electric vehicles and capturing the economic opportunities in this fast growing industry, as well as delivering outcomes through national waste policy, including better engagement with local government sector. Access to affordable housing and assisting our city's homeless is front of mind priority for our community. And we seek policies and funding that will assist us in achieving our ambitions to end, uh, ambitions to end street homelessness. We also want to hear about policies regarding provision of adequate social and affordable housing to meet the ever-growing shortfall of affordable accommodation. Later this morning, you will each have the opportunity to ask questions directly of the field of candidates vying for the seat of Adelaide. And I encourage you all to think about the issues that are most important to you and to come forward with your questions. Uh, to borrow the old saying, every vote counts. And with record enrolments this year, the public engagement is high. So I wish all candidates well, and I look forward to hearing from everybody shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And while you're enjoying breakfast and listening to our candidates today, we are certainly urging everyone to make sure you pull out your phone and participate in the story online. Our hashtags this morning are hashtag OzVotes and hashtag Adelaide. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the stage all of our candidates. So as the candidates are making their way onto stage, so how we're going to operate this morning is I will introduce each candidate, as I said, in the order of the ballot paper. They will then have three minutes to speak. Uh, they will get a bell when there's 15 seconds left. Oh, yeah, there's our bell ringer. Well done, thank you. Uh, and they'll get a second bell as they uh, move over the three minutes. And should anybody insist on going even further, I will politely, um, but... Uh, Yes, I'll politely pull them up, I think is probably the best way to do it. So, we are asked all of the candidates this morning to speak to you about their vision for Adelaide and their party platforms. So, let's get this underway. Our first, our first speaker this morning will be Chris James, who is standing for the Australian Democrats. Chris is 29 years old, working full-time in the hospitality industry and studying externally with the University of South Australia. He is running as the Democrats candidate for Adelaide because he's passionate about the future of our country and strongly believes that in order to, do it, to achieve great things, we must work together and lift each other up. His campaign has focused around the issues that face the people of Adelaide and the nation as a whole today. He believes our health care needs to do more for those dealing with mental health, health rather, people living with disabilities, the elderly and living in rural areas that the education system needs to work for all Australians and all should have equal access to education based on a willingness to learn, not their ability to pay. 
He believes in a need for a strong long-term plan to act on climate change and energy supply, and this needs to be a priority for the next parliament. Would you please welcome Chris? Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris James, and I'm the Australian Democrats candidate for Adelaide. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people. I'd also like to pay respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. I work full time in the hospitality industry, and I, I study externally with the University of South Australia. I've always had a passion for people, and I've always had a passion for, the, for our country. The Democrats inspired me through their vision of a politics that was driven by kindness and collaboration. The Democrats have a vision that is a sensible alternative to the major parties, a vision that puts people first. I made the decision to run this election because I believed in that vision, and I believed that the policies of the Democrats aligned with my own beliefs more than any other party. I may be young, but my passion is to lift people up. It's to encourage us all to be the best that we can be the best country we can be. And through working together, listening to people and acting for the people, I believe we can all achieve great things. The concerns of the people of Adelaide are real and they are echoed around the country. We need representatives that will represent, that will lead in the best interests of all Australians, leaders that will inspire us. Climate change, as to most people, is a big concern for me. We need a long-term vision a long-term plan where we can transition to renewable energy and lower our emissions, whilst creating economic growth, new jobs, stable, affordable energy supply. I am a Democrat because I believe in this vision. I am a Democrat because I believe that education is a long-term investment that will only benefit us all. The benefits of a good education system far outweighs the cost of providing it. Education is an investment in our economy it's an investment in our health and it's an investment in our communities through social, uh, critical thinking and social cohesion. All Australians should have equal access to education based on their willingness to learn and not on their ability to pay. I am a Democrat because I believe in the importance of good health care. Australia is blessed, best to have one of the best health care systems in the world. However, we can make it better. Mental health is an issue that's very close to my heart. It's close to my heart because I have struggled with it myself. I was one that seeked help. We must do better. Healthcare also needs to provide for people living with disabilities, the elderly and people in rural areas. Healthcare is essential to the happiness and well-being of our society and we must make it priority. Thank you to the Adelaide City Council for organizing this event and for their invite. And thank you for you all to be, for being here today. Thank you, Chris, and appreciate your very fine timing. You did very well. That, ladies and gentlemen, was Chris James of the Australian Democrats. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Barbara Pocock, the Greens candidate. Barbara Pocock is an emeritus professor at the University of South Australia. She grew up on a Mallee farm and has lived in Adelaide for most of her adult life. She was educated as an economist and worked in universities in research, policy and advocacy. Beyond universities, Barbara has also worked in the Reserve Bank, unions, government, advising politicians, on farms and as a working mother. She served on many boards and established and led the Centre for Work and Life, the UniSA, for 10 years until retirement in 2014. Barbara was made a member of the Order of Australia AM in 2010 for services to industrial relations research and for her advocacy of social justice. She's presented her research in many countries and written many articles and books. Would you please welcome Barbara Pocock. Thanks so much, Lee, and I also pay my respects to the Ghana people and their custodianship of the beautiful Ghana plans on, plains on which we're meeting this morning. And thanks so much for being here. I love living in a city where we can come together, talk politics, disagree, be civil, and be safe. It's, it's a fine thing. I'd just like in my few minutes to tell you a bit about myself and what I stand for. As Lee said, I've lived in Adelaide most of my adult life, but I grew up on a Mallee sheep farm 200 kilometres to the east of where we're sitting. 
My parents' politics were a long way from mine, but they said people get the government they deserve. In my little town of Lamaru, at a very young age, I was interested in who was poor and who was rich and how that turned out, how did that happen in my town, and that took me to economics. And I've spent most of the last 40 years studying employment, how to make it better for workplaces for men and for women. I've briefed every political party and many leaders and given evidence at many parliamentary inquiries, conferences and public hearings. But five years after retiring from all of that, I've jumped the fence from studying the world to trying to change it. Like many of you in this room, I won the trifecta. Free ed education in a university, early access to affordable housing in my 30s, and decent and secure work. Very few of the young people in my life have access to these three things. In this context, free university in a world-class education and research system is a priority for me and the Greens as is more secure work and fairer working conditions and changes in housing and tax policy that are fairer and can fund the things that we really want. But more than anything, I believe the 2019 election is a climate election. We live in a beautiful green city that can teach the world a lot about urban design, green infrastructure and finding a path to a low carbon future. And this council is well on that way. But the world scientists tell us that there are not many elections left before it will be too late to stop catastrophic global warming. And that's what's at stake in this 2019 election. That's why I'm running, and that's why I'm running for the Greens. It's a party that's been on the right side of history for climate and the environment for decades. It's a party that has an ambitious plan to accelerate our shift to renewable energy and to find a fair transition away from coal. It's a party that opposes putting our pristine bite at risk and the tourism uh, and fishing industries that hang off it. It's a party that's fighting hard for our river, especially through the work of Senator Sarah Hanson-Young and the Royal Commission that we need to get the bottom of what's gone wrong. It's a party that's ahead of the game in calling for marriage equality, Royal Commission into banking and for an independent commission into corruption long before any of these were fashionable a party that's consistently refused to give in to racism and fear and will fight for principles on human rights. So we need some, to make some choices. We can make good choices in this city and we need to stand up for our environment and for a good future for our planet and the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And that's Barbara Pocock, the Greens candidate. Next, we'll welcome Steve Georgianis, the Australian Labor Party candidate. Steve was born in the electorate in Mile End and has lived in the area his entire life. He's worked as a factory assembly line, as an underwriter, a policy advisor, and a taxi driver. He's currently working as an organiser advocating for workers' rights in the airline and local government sectors. He's a member of the boards of Statewide Super and the West Adelaide Sandful Football Club and Theberton Senior College. Previously, Steve held the seat of Hindmarsh and served as the second Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. He served on many uh, committees, rather, including as Chair of the Health and Ageing Committee. In Parliament, Steve was a strong advocate for local jobs, fighting offshoring of call centre work and successfully lobbying for the establishment of the Aircraft Noise Ombudsman. Steve championed greater scrutiny of the live animal export trade and supported a shift to onshore slaughter and meat processing to create more jobs and protect animal welfare. Steve's top priority has been to secure an order for, uh, an order rather, for 12 locally manufactured submarines and he will fight hard for working families by ensuring there is access to quality education and healthcare services. Please welcome Steve. Thank you uh, very much and um, can I also say, acknowledge that the land that we meet on today is the land of the Kaurna people and we pay our respects uh, to those elders past and present. And uh, just one quick clarification, um, I'm no longer a member of Statewide Super, sorry, no longer a board member of Statewide Super, West Adelaide Football Club and Thibden Senior College. Um, when I was re-elected in 2016, I resigned from those board positions. Um, can I say this election for me is one of the most important elections that this nation has faced. And I say so because we are at a critical, crucial point, a turning point, um, which will uh, uh, picture the, uh, paint the picture of Australia for the future, 
um, in terms of climate change, in terms of a whole range of things that we have to do right uh, at this point. So for me, it is very critical. But before I go on to those things, just very quickly, uh, a little bit about myself. You heard the, uh, uh, the bio, but um, I lived in Mylin, I've lived in Mylin all my life. Uh, I've brought up my children there. I've worked in the western suburbs most of my life. My parents came out here in the 50s. My father in 53, my mother in 56. They came out to a nation where they spoke very little English. Um, they had uh, no skills. Uh, they came from one of the poorest nations in Europe, southern Greece, after World War II and after a civil war. Uh, they worked in factories. Um, my mother worked as a cleaner at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Uh, they were called domestic in those days. But yet they were able to fulfil their dreams in this nation. Um, Australia gave us an opportunity. It gave my parents an opportunity from a very poor background to be able to carve out a life uh, with dignity. And they did so because of the laws and legislations that existed in this nation. Uh, the law was equal, whether you were from overseas, whether whatever was happening, for them, they were paid the same wages, they had the same rights, uh, and all the opportunities as any other child had when we were growing up as well. And that's something very special in our history. Uh, it is very special. And what I want to see as a federal member of parliament is to be able to give that same opportunity that my family had to get ahead and I'm not talking get ahead economically and make millions or whatever it is, but just to do the basic things that human beings want to do uh, because of the laws and legislation that were in place in this country. And I want to be able to give that opportunity to the next generation of Australians and others who are starting out in our nation uh, in perhaps the same situation as my parents or a little bit less. There's many more things, climate change and a whole range of others, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And that was Steve Georgianis, the Australian Labor Party candidate. Next to address us this morning is Deanna Kangas, who is representing the Animal Justice Party. Deanna Kangas is a professional cabaret performer as well as the company director of Voice House. Born in Adelaide, she's lived in this beautiful state for her entire life and has been fortunate enough to run her own business in the Adelaide CBD for the past 10 years. Deanna is a passionate animal rights activist and believes that to create fast and effective change, we must stand up and speak at every chance we get by covering all angles from grassroots activism right through to the necessary legislative changes made by the party. Together, we can work towards giving animals their right to freedom. Alongside running in the forthcoming election, Deanna currently coordinates the SA chapter of Anonymous for the Voiceless, as well as using her decades of media experience to speak up for animals publicly and she was nominated for Peter's, uh, Peter Australia's Hottest Vegan in 2018. Would you please welcome Deanna? Hello everyone. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land um, before I get started. My name is Deanna Kangas and I am the federal election candidate uh, for the Animal Justice Party in the seat of Adelaide. And I'm sure the first question you're all asking is who let the vegan on stage? I'm here today, so let's see what I have to say. Um, now, thank you for having me here today to tell you a little bit more about myself and the Animal Justice Party. You see, like many of the other candidates here before me today, I too am a born and bred Adelaide girl. But no matter how local we are, this is a federal election and we have many important changes to be made to ensure the growth and protection of this beautiful country of ours. Now, one of our three levels of government needs to deal with the big issues, both national and international in importance. And that's why we are all here today. So this begs the question then, of course, why the Animal Justice Party? You see, the Animal Justice Party was formed to fill the gaps in policies overlooked by many of the larger parties. As you are aware, climate change is the biggest issue facing all of us. Every person, every species. 
Yet the Animal Justice Party is the only party who accepts all of the evidence and has a science-based climate change policy. Australia currently has more cattle than people. This means that our livestock generate more warming than all of our coal-powered coal pow coal power stations. Sorry about that. <laughs> In addition to climate change, the Animal Justice Party's primary focus on animals generates policy implications across the political landscape. For example, our policies also have a profound impact on human health and species biodiversity. You see, Australia isn't just a country of 24 million people. Australia is also home to 28 million cattle and 70 million sheep. And most of our environmental impact comes from animals, not humans. Our focus on a plant-based food supply would eventually allow us to slash healthcare spending. It also allows us to rewild and reforest vast areas of Australia, currently occupied by sheep and cattle. With government support, Australia's farmers could transition into high-valued crops for people instead of feed for the animals. So in conclusion, a vote for the Animal Justice Party is a vote to combat our climate emergency. It's a vote for a sustainable future, and above all, it's a vote for kindness. And of course, what could be more Aussie than that? Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. <coughs> Sorry, that was Deanna Kangas, the Animal Justice Party candidate. Our next candidate we will hear from is Sean Osborn, the Liberal candidate. Sean is a long-serving South Australian police officer with experience as a detective at the Major Crime Investigation Branch. After 20 years of service with the South Australian Police, Sean is committed to continuing to serve the Adelaide community in federal parliament. He believes he is an experienced and driven South Australian leader with strong connections to the city of Adelaide and its surrounding areas. Sean is a passionate community volunteer with many years of service with the Lions Club of Prospect and Blair Athol, Chinatown Adelaide Association of South Australia, Relationships Australia, the Street Family Homeless Charity and many multicultural groups. In his career and in his own time, Sean believes he has demonstrated a deep commitment to serving our community. Would you please welcome Sean? Good morning and thank you to everybody for coming out early to participate in our fabulous democratic process. I would also like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on Ghana land and echo the appropriate respects. I'm standing in the seat of Adelaide to offer the benefit of my knowledge and collective experience to the people of Adelaide, South Australia and our nation to help deliver positive progress now and into the future. My working life to date has included over 20 years serving the people of Adelaide and across South Australia as a police detective, community volunteer and migrant ag advocate. At the age of 19, I learnt that police work is utterly focused on helping individuals and the broader community with problems and concerns affecting their lives. My job has been to use the resources available to me to make things better, support people through difficulty and standing against threats to everyone's safety, security and prosperity. This is the core personal attitude I want to bring into the National Parliament as the Member for Adelaide. I have seen and I have learned an immense amount from the front lines tackling the, so the social issues that will continue to challenge us and are presently. Issues that are present in every, every suburb, city, town, state, across our nation. Standing up as strongly as possible against all forms of violence, particularly against the vulnerable, is extremely important to me, and I believe everyone here. Last night, with many of you, I attended a vigil in our city for those killed, injured, and still suffering from the disgraceful scourge of domestic and family violence in our society. Tackling the social and safety impacts on our communities of violence, abuse of the vulnerable, the illicit drug trade, poverty, 
homelessness and other related issues at every level by and beyond government must continue. Addressing these and every other challenge, be it local, national or global, requires dedicated, hard-working representatives working to build a strong and prosperous Australia with sound economic and financial management, providing the real means to invest in better and increased essential services, job creation, environmental protection, a strong, secure and generous nation, lower taxes and reduced cost of living for us all. The hard reality is that each investment requires funding that comes from government managing the collection and distribution of revenue. Hope and unfunded promises put forward by Bill Shorten and Labor are not responsible strategy to deliver what we need and desire for our future and the generations of Australians to come. The Morrison government has delivered a budget surplus, the first in 12 years. My apologies, I, I thought that was the one minute bill, that's not. 15 seconds, okay. Um, I want to work with you all and thank you for coming as a vibrant, passionate local federal representative now as soon as possible and for as long as possible. I thank you. Thank you, Sean. And that was uh, much taller than me, Sean Osborne, the Liberal candidate. Our final candidate that we're going to hear from this morning is Antonio Rhee, who is the United Australia Party candidate. Born and raised in Adelaide, and he says a beloved North Adelaide supporter. Antonio has worked his way around Australia and overseas, incorporating, incorporating values he believes will assist in ensuring Australia is moving in the right direction. He is married to his wife, Joanne, and this year they will celebrate their 20th anniversary. They have three teenage boys who they have guided to value their independence and that life is full of opportunities. Antonio presently works as a national procurement manager and is very passionate about education, health, and the important well-being of everyday Australians. Antonio believes he understands firsthand the everyday pressures that families face with the rising cost of living, including exorbitant electricity prices. He firmly believes that Australians have had enough of the bubble approach our politicians take to everyday Australians. Antonio believes, and I quote, for too long now we've had to endure politicians acting like children and worrying about what the polls say. True leadership is about integrity and truly valuing their people. Would you please welcome Antonio. Good morning. Um, I too would like to acknowledge um, that we're meeting a country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to the elders past and present. Um, I'd like to thank the Lord Mayor and the team for inviting me. Um, to this wonderful occasion and for everyone for turning up. Um, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit about myself. I've worked in various industries. Um, I'm an ex-serviceman who, from the Royal Australian Navy, trade as a chef. Um, so like Chris, I've worked in the hospitality industry. Um, but I have also worked in healthcare, aged care. Um, I've also worked in immigration in regards to the Infobrachy Centre, helping um, those less fortunate come to this country um, and get, help them assimilate into, um, into Adelaide itself, some of them who I'm still quite good friends with. Um, like Steve, I'm, um, my parents immigrated to Australia quite, um, hopefully they're not here because I can't remember the year they came. <laughs> but, um, and I, I um, have three teenage sons, as Lee just mentioned, and one of my reasons for presenting myself and standing in front of you, I was a little bit nervous, so excuse me, um, is that I, I regularly speak with my children and coming from an Italian background, um, large family like Steve and various combined teachers, um, private, in, private business owners. Um, but the main one for me is my children, especially my 18 year old son and speaking to him is their pessimism in, in the country and how they're concerned over that Australia doesn't have any shared vision over the next 10 years. Obviously climate change is one of them. Um, the other one that my eldest son is very concerned about, who I speak to daily because um, obviously he needs to be able to speak his concerns to his dad, that's my belief, has been housing affordability, employment, climate change, all topics that we're all here to, to express. Um, 
obviously, for myself, yes, I'm standing here for the United Australia Party, um, and that comes with various um, connotations, I'd imagine. Um, but for me, I'm actually like to believe that the party is bigger than the man. Um, that's no pun intended, by the way. Um, <laughs> and he's here today, so I'm probably going to get in trouble for that. But um, <laughs> hopefully he doesn't record it. But for me, it, it's more about, as I believe true leadership is about integrity. I believe it's important that the, that the community and Australians understand, and that's not the one minute bell shot. <laughs> just 10 seconds but um yeah i'm here because i believe there's an opportunity for this country to go take the next step and and look forward to the next 10 years thank you thank you and that was antonio re the united australia party candidate well ladies and gentlemen now it's your chance it's your chance to ask a question of any or all of the candidates um, you'll find there is a microphone, two microphones, one on either stage of the auditorium. So if you've got a question, I'd ask you to come forward now, which would be terrific. A um, couple of sort of uh, uh, details around asking a question. We, if you wouldn't mind, as I said, we'd like you to come to the, the microphone, form a queue. It's not a crowd at the moment, is that right? Um, uh, I will ask from side to side when there is certain questions. Uh, if you could keep your answers or your questions fairly concise, and a question rather than a statement is always valued, and I would ask of our, if you could direct it to a specific candidate, uh, and then I would ask our candidates also to uh, give us a fairly concise answer. So, we have a question, thank goodness. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself and who you'd like to address. Sure, uh, my name's Hayden, I'm from the Anti-Poverty Network in South Australia. I'm sorry, Lee, this is a question to everyone. Yep. Um, with hundreds of thousands of people living on the abhorrently low rate of New Start, so far, so far below the poverty line, and many more who should be on it, on a disability pension, and the current government's focus on numbers and removing people from New Start, the seat of Adelaide has 4,747 people on New Start and 3,044 on youth allowance. I consider the low rate deliberately keeping so many people in poverty a, a national emergency. Barbara said it best when she said, we need to make some choices. What will each of you and your parties do to address this? Okay, who would like to take that first, Steve? Thank you uh, very much for that question and a, a very important question. Um, we know that when the current amount that they're receiving, if you're on New Start or um, uh, other payments, when you're not working and you can't find work, we know through different economic studies that are done that the money that they're currently actually earning is so low that it's preventing people from getting jobs. When you can't afford your bus fare, when you uh, can't afford to pay your mobile so people can text you about interviews. So we know that the amount currently certainly is not there for those people to actually be able to help in the system to do the things they need to do to apply for jobs to do courses, perhaps to um, uh, transport, etc. So what we have said yeah. is that we will um, uh, have an inquiry immediately within the first 100 days, if we are privileged to form government, to look at the needs, what's required, and then come up with a decision of what amount. Now, many are saying to me, why an inquiry? Well, this is the exact same process we used in 2008 when we increased the aged pension uh, under Kevin Rudd. Uh, we held an inquiry, we worked out what the needs were and adjusted the pension, which was the first rise in the pension in the history of Australia, apart from the CPI so Steve, and the other things. Just so we're not going yep. over a history lesson, so what you're saying is the Labor Party, if elected, would hold an inquiry and then come up with a decision? Correct, within the first 100 days of government. Okay, thank you. I know that Barbara also wanted to answer this. Yes, um, after 28 years of continuous economic growth, we haven't increased New Start for 25 years in real terms. And it's the most shocking thing I have found doing door knocking around this whole seat. The inequality within our area is really shameful for such a wealthy city. And we can do it and we should do it quickly. The Greens have got a position of an immediate $75 a week increase. That will make such a difference. It'll put food on tables in houses. Houses many of us would be surprised 
you know, uh, are really, really struggling, in, especially in terms of housing. So two things, we need to raise the rate immediately, in my view, and then index it in the way that we index the pension so that people aren't back holding out a bowl in five years' time. We need to keep it up to date with community standards and we need to do something about housing because many people on New Start and many working poor, food bank in this town is increasing its, its offering of food at tw the rate of 20% a year and it's done that for the last five years. There are a lot of poor working poor in our town as well. So I think we need to move quickly on housing and on raising New Start. Would, thank you. <laughs> Would any of the other candidates, yes? Sean? Thank you, thank you for the question and um, just to give some clarity or some context, I'm aware of the pain that exists um, through family, friends um, and the work that I've done in the homelessness uh, sector in South Australia and particularly in our city. Any increase needs to be paid for. We need to fund all increases for services and support and the best way to do that is through a strong economy. We are earning money as a country for the first time in 12 years. We're not losing it based on our budget position. I will be a strong advocate to increase across the board wherever we possibly can. Um, I know pensioners, disability and other um, that count the coins um, and they struggle to provide beyond the basic. Um, I know these people personally. The Morrison government has and will work hard to provide more and more to people that need it. We will do that through economic growth, through helping people find work. The best form of welfare is employment. Those that aren't able to be employed need our support mm -hmm. and, and that is why we work hard. Um, anybody else want to answer this before I move on to another question? Frank's, oh, hello. Frank's Hayden for your question. Um, look, myself and I know the party, we new start, it's not a discussion, it's just raise it as CPI, it's pretty easy. Um, and we've already mentioned in regards to the pension as well. Um, so yeah, we're all for that. Okay, Chris, I think you want to comment? Well, I'm happy to say that the Democrats will support a raise in new start. Um, the growing inequality in this country is, is just becoming ridiculous. And I think we need to really um, review things like pension and, and, make, and uh, New Start and make sure that, um, that everyone is living comfortably. Um, yeah. Okay. And Deanna, just so I don't make sure you don't miss out, a final comment on this question? Of course. Um, obviously, one of the things the Animal Justice Party doesn't have, um, well, won't officially be doing is putting policies in place around this, but in response to what you are saying, as someone who has um, been a business owner for the last 11 years, I got into business in my 20s, I understand the struggles um, that are faced by younger generations um, here to try and get ahead and do the things that we want to do, and I work with young people on a daily basis, people in their 20s as well, and they just want to be able to have the money that they need to get the skills that they need in life to be able to get ahead. Um, so it is very important and obviously um, the Animal Justice Party does advocate for kindness, rationality and equality and that is well within uh, something that we would vote for 100%. Okay, thank you. So we've got our first question underway and I've got a question over here to my left and we've got plenty of room behind this lovely lady if there, and I've got more questions over here, obviously. Go ahead. Good morning, my name's Tessa. Um, I'm a student uh, at Adelaide University. Um, my question's for Mr. Osborne. Um, I'm really excited to hear that you attended uh, the vigil for domestic violence and glad to hear that it's so important to you. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, it's okay. Um, seeing as this is such an important issue to you, what is your response to um, your party uh, not pledging to fully fund the domestic violence programs um, or matching Labor's commitment to support tailored packages. Sean? So, thank you. Sorry, I, 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 just missed, I just missed the last couple of words. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, uh, what is your response uh, to uh, the Liberal Party not pledging to fully fund 
uh, anti-domestic violence programs or match Labor's commitment to tailored support packages for victims? Thank you for the question. I was present recently with um, uh, Minister Paul Fletcher for uh, funding uh, announcements and increases to frontline services at um, the Domestic Violence National Hotline and the support that's provided uh, in Adelaide across the country. Um, you're quite correct that this is a, a very uh, personal issue for me because I've spent a, a lot of the last uh, 10 years of my working life um, dealing with the entire spectrum of the problem um, from people in situations that um, the, so the cycle of violence is building right through to the tragedies where um, people, largely women, lose their lives. Um, more than one woman per week is killed in Australia by a, a current or former domestic partner and I've seen the immense grief and effect and flow and effect to families through that. Having a, a view of that spectrum and, and knowing where those points of intervention are, um, I spent uh, two years working at the State Coroner's Court, so the level of detail that I've seen these issues is, is extreme. My pledge is to, as part of a, a re-elected Morrison government, fight extremely hard for whatever service, increase, support or funding is required to end this, as I said, scourge in our community as soon as possible, as broadly as possible. I'll be a warrior in that party room. That, that's what we need. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Next question over here to my right. Good morning. Um, my name's Ned Fury. I'm the president of United Nations Youth South Australia, um, which is the state's largest youth-run non-profit. Um, one of the programs that we run is um, the Youth Representative to the United Nations. Um, it's the largest annual survey of young people in Australia. Um, one of the questions that we ask as part of that um, is whether young people feel represented in politics. Um, we've surveyed about 1,000 young South Australians so far this year. Not one has said that they feel represented in politics. And your uh, question? How would any of the panellists um, change that and make young people feel better represented? Anybody want to take that one? Yep. Um, I think a representative parliament is extremely important and that means um, gender, that means age, sexuality, um, religion. It's, it, it's, we need a parliament that represents the people. In order to do that, we need the, the parliament to reflect that. Um, in terms of youth, I think it's encouraging young people to be part of politics. Um, me and Deanna are probably around the same age, 30, uh, 29 and 30. So, um, you know, if we can encourage, you know, even two or three people to get involved in politics just through us doing it, um, you know, that's a win for us. And, um, yeah, I think, but we also need to do it with our vote as well. We need to get out there and vote for um, people that we want to represent us in Parliament. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, Steve, down the end. If we um, have a shortened government, what will the shortened government do to encourage you. greater youth participation? Um, very important question because uh, in the 15 years that I've been an MP, uh, one of the things I hear constantly is I feel disengaged from the system, from younger people. Um, and that's sad because uh, younger people are our future. They're the ones that will make the decisions in the future um, and change this country for, for the better. But I think what we need is to ensure that, uh, and certainly I, I know that through me uh, and my office, we constantly talk to young people. We've had many young people get involved in politics and actually feel engaged. Uh, we have uh, a whole arm, uh, the Young Labor uh, branch of the Australian Labor Party, where many people um, under 25 are engaged. They uh, uh, get involved in politics. I'm not saying the Australian Labor Party, there's many other political parties out there, but how do you connect people to our political system is, is the big question here. And one of the things um, that I think personally uh, is that we need more civic studies at school to get kids to understand the connection uh, and how they can make a change through our political system. And we have got a good political system. I mean, it's one of the best that I've seen around the world. I mean, it's, there's things that we can change about it and things that we don't like, but it is still one of the most democratic and open um, political systems anywhere in the world. 
uh, and it's a pity when we can't get these young kids to engage. So we need to ensure that through their education, um, there is, uh, uh, th th there's ample opportunities for them to understand the system and then how to fit into the system to make those changes. Uh, one of the okay. things that actually motivates kids more than anything is when there's a particular issue. And we saw recently um, all those kids march for climate change. Yep. Now that was something that motivated them. They were out there and they're trying to make a change. And that, those kids that participated in that will see the example of how that has affected um, uh, policy making in terms of their actions. And we'll continue on and take on other issues as well. Thank you, Steve. Barbara, I know you want to comment. Um, I'm really proud that the Greens are running <coughs> uh, candidates in all the lower house seats in this federal election and that a number of the candidates are young and certainly Senator Her Sarah Hanson Young was the youngest woman to be elected into the Senate at that time and I absolutely agree with the point that we need more young people in our parliament. I, I think the other thing we need to do is make sure that we take up the issues in a meaningful way that young people care about. And I think many young people look to the last 10 years when we've had the science, for example, on climate change and we've seen a bumbling uh, fight and a lot of theatre and, and not action. And I think people, young people want, will engage where they see the opportunity to influence and where real action happens. Okay. So, Sorry. Any further comments? <laughs> yep. Deanna? Um, what, what I think you're saying is, is, is extremely important and the thing is um, when it comes to obviously young people, one of the things the Animal Justice Party um, advocates for is better education around these things and I think that's uh, really where the gap is in Parliament is that enough of young people like ourselves aren't actually in Parliament representing ourselves, understanding what we go through as a generation because it's one thing for the older generations to sympathise with us but it's another thing to actually experience it in a different lifetime, in a different decade. Um, and so I think the more education we can have through our schooling systems on people to understand the importance of politics from a young age and more of us representing, moving forward, we should be able to um, then have our voice as we deserve. So that was just my comment on that. Okay, Antonio and then Sean. Yeah, look, great question. As I said earlier, I have an 18-year-old son. I have a bit of an open house, which my wife doesn't like because she there's a lot of cleaning products after me. Um, I think there's an old saying that you lead from the front. One of the problems for the young, um, my son and his friends, um, is particularly what they see is the theatre, the reaction, as Barbara pointed out, not taking issues seriously, um, forgetting the whole process of why you're up and representing the country and tackling these things head on, not putting the drama and the showcasing and forgetting why the young people, um, I think young people will, and it's great to see Chris and Deanna, I still think myself young, I may not look it, but I still think it. Um, but it's important that they can see, um, they, will, they will take up the fight if they understand that it's a process that they will get heard. And that's the biggest thing, it's being heard. Okay, thank you. And finally on this, Sean. Thank you, just briefly, um, just like to remind <coughs> remind everybody that, and I, I echo um, what everybody said, and I certainly know that there are young people engaged in my campaign and helping me, and, and really enthused by what they're seeing of the democratic process of Australia. In recent times, we've seen um, immense renewal at the local and state government level. In our most recent two elections, we've had a lot of younger representatives elected as councillors, as mayors and as state politicians. So I, I actually believe this is progressing well. Okay, thank you. I'll take a question over here because I know you've been waiting a while. Hi, firstly, thank you to um, the Mayor, Sandy, Lee, and the federal candidates for spending time today um, to come here to answer our questions. Um, my name's Laurel Mould and I'm the coordinator of FADVAN, Family and Domestic Violence Advocacy Network. Um, I won't actually ask the question I was gonna ask about domestic violence, but thank you for actually asking that question. Um, my question is, we've all heard of the, the gender pay gap. I want to know what policies or strategies or thoughts people might have on the gender investment gap. I'm part of Chooks SA and that's one of our big themes um, and I'd like to know what you may consider about that. Okay, so the gender, the gender pay gap. No, gender investment, gender oh. investment gap, which right. is a lot greater than the gender pay gap. Okay, gender investment gap. Who would like to respond to that? Could you explain what the gender investment gap is? Please. 
Um, it's known that when, and Moira Ware that actually has um, headed this up, she's a lot better at describing it than me, but what the investment, the gender investment gap is, is when you have um, businesses, entrepreneurs, investors wanting to invest in companies, it is known that the majority go to males. Um, and so what we're finding is that there are a lot of women that have got great ideas, um, that are pitching their ideas in many different forums, but there still is a massive gap in how many are supported in that. So it's called the investment, the gender investment gap, and even just to raise it here is an incredible opportunity. So I, I um, encourage you to, to look that up if you don't actually know exactly. Okay, does anybody want to respond? Barbara, yes? I think what you're talking about is very real, and, and it, it, um, the differences between men and women and the opportunities available to them permeate every sphere of our lives, our public lives. And it's no surprise that when, when there is a pitching process or whatever, that networks that are established um, often advantage the, the gender which has the dominant position in our business communities. There, it is great to see many men now understand what a cost that is uh, to our community, that we don't foster the bright, fabulous women of all ages with ideas and opportunities for our state and more broadly. So I, I think we need the kind of initiatives that we see in many other uh, occupations and funding programs, which is attention to who gets what, uh, creating special opportunities to make sure young women do get forward and older women as well. Um, and it's certainly clear when we look at who has what in, la in later age, we need to make more opportunities available to women across our community because women take into their retirement, in many cases, 40 years hard work in the labour market, raising a family, and 42% of men's earnings in super, and a third of women having no super at all. So it's a mixed picture and we can fix it, but it takes direct attention. Okay, does anybody else want to respond to that or I'll move on to the next question? All right, I'll question over here. Hello, um, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Nadia Moffat. Um, I represent one of 22% of the population in South Australia that live with a disability. I've had two major strokes and I've worked full time for many years to support myself and my independence. And as Sean said earlier that employment is the best form of welfare, I strongly believe that. And in spite of Deloitte's access writing report on the economic benefits of increasing the employment rate of people with a disability, we're still overrepresented in unemployment statistics at over 50%. I want to know people's views on disability and employment and how we can improve those statistics. Okay, who would like to take that first? Sean? Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for raising the issue. As um, friends of mine that uh, are afflicted by disability and want to work and, and want to do as much work as they can and build their experience and their knowledge and their employability for further um, uh, levels of employment, uh, talking to me about disability wage and, and access to, to work, transport, I get it. I see the passion and I see the dedication and I commend you for working hard despite the affliction to provide for yourself and family and perhaps the, the issue needs to be taken seriously and it needs to be invested in. And once again, it's something that um, based on personal knowledge, um, I undertake to commit to because I see the positive benefits. Um, there are currently nearly 5,000 jobs listed in the um, available positions in this postcode alone. Helping people secure those jobs, secure something that is aspirational for them and that they can build those skills is so important. And whatever government can do to smooth the road to that process, it should do. Uh, anybody else, how are we going to better support those in the community living with disability with their employment opportunities? Steve? Th thank you very much, Lydia, for that um, uh, for, for your question. Uh, and you're quite right, the, the, the best way um, is through employment, um, which uh, ensures that you work, you earn money, you can pay for your bills, etc. Um, but we also need to give people with disabilities the support that they require uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of their needs. And one of the things that we've seen is a great idea, the NDIS that's out there. Um, 
there's heaps of bugs with it at the moment. Uh, but one of the things that we've said is the $1.9 billion that's been taken out of it, we will restore uh, to ensure that those people get the services that they require. Every day at the moment, uh, in my electorate office, we're dealing with people uh, who, have, uh, who have applied for the NDIS, um, who are not getting the services they require, uh, that reviews are being done that take months and months and months. Their position deteriorates and their whole situation changes and then they're asked to do another review. So one of the things that we could do is streamlining their services that they applied for, whether it be Centrelink or other things, uh, where there is a constant, constant, uh, continuous, um, uh, 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 I suppose, application of, of trying to justify their disability to be able to receive payments. Now, when you're doing something like that constantly, it takes you away from trying to concentrate on perhaps uh, finding some work, which is very difficult as it is for someone with a disability. And I just saw that program recently on SBS, which was just amazing, those three people, uh, four people with disabilities that were applying for jobs. We need to give them more support uh, and, and ensure that, they, that the services they required are there uh, and to, to basically be able to, to find work with those that uh, want to work. So streamlining the NDS. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any other comments from the panel? Yes? Yeah, I think, thank you, Nadia, for your question. Um, I think encouraging, um, uh, sorry, investment in training and better services with the NDIS for more um, support for that reason. Okay, thank you. I'll move back over here to our next question, please. Hi, my name is Midge Tanner. Um, given the fact that around $9 billion has been spent in the last three years on maintaining the offshore processing policy on Manus Island and Nauru, given Scott Morrison's $186 million dummy spit in opening and then immediately um, announcing the closing of Christmas Island Detention Centre, Given the fact that the offshore detention policies have resulted in amazing um, levels of corruption on both Manus Island and Nauru. And your question, please. Uh, the question is a very brief answer from each of the candidates. Will you support the closing of offshore detention and um, bring all remaining refugees and asylum seekers to Australia? Thank you. Barbara, if you'd like to start. Yes. There you go. John. Offshore detention is the policy of the Morrison government. It has kept our borders secure and stopped the people smuggling trade that has resulted in thousands of deaths. Okay. Chris. Absolutely, to closing closing the detention centres. No one um, no one feels comfortable when they see these things going on, on on television. You know, people harming themselves, people with mental uh, illness, because of what we are doing to these people. It's 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 frightening. Um, no one, I don't think anyone is um, saying that we have open borders, but we need to still have. Um, a vetting process and, and make sure we know who's coming here, but um, in terms of holding people in prisons for long periods of time, no. Thank you. Deanna, a yes or a no? Um, absolutely. I think, um, like you said, we do need to have some sort of a vetting process, but at the end of the day, we are all humans and we're all born of the same stuff and we all have the same thoughts, feelings and emotions in the same way that the Animal Justice Party might have the feelings towards animals being sentient beings as are all of these people as well. And I mean, my um, you know ancestors were lucky enough to come here from Italy many years ago. Um, and I know that they didn't have to go through a process like that. And they came here for a better life. And I just can't imagine what the people who are on one side of the world thinking one thing and then coming here going through that process are going through and if we care about each other um, and about our mental health then it is important that this is addressed properly as equals 100 percent thank you antonio um obviously as i mentioned at the beginning um yes by the way so <laughs> so um yes i 
as I said, I worked at Inverbrackie Detention Centre. Um, I got to see firsthand the hardships that families had come to, the reasons why they came to it. Um, and a lot of it was just bureaucracy, red tape, when it was so easy just to process the people and why they came to this country for a better life. So, yes. And Steve, offshore processing and detention? Thank you. Um, look, uh, uh, what we've said we'll do is ensure that the processing is done much quicker in a humane way, so people are out of those detention centres as quickly as possible once they're vetted, processed, etc. We did, uh, uh, together with the independents and the House reps in the last few sittings, move to uh, uh, get rid of that cruel policy where people couldn't seek uh, medical treatment in Australia. Uh, and secondly, what we will get rid of is the political football game that's being played through the language that's being used with refugees. Um, they're not political footballs, they're human beings. And for far too long, we've been watching this political game where we're using vulnerable human beings who've gone through the worst of their lives. Um, and this will be a stain on our history, I suspect. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take another question from over to my left. Hello there, um, my name's Elaine. Um, I'm here to ask about something which hasn't been mentioned yet. Sometimes we forget it, sometimes we take it for granted. Um, I'm a member of Friends of Parks group involved with a heritage site. Well, we're all talking about economic development, growth, moving forward, doing new things. We have a subsidiary called Renew SA. Why are we forgetting about old things? Old things can be very important. They're so important that they give us communal identity, give us something to be proud of. Somewhere we can work towards from that. So you can take the new ideas, build them into something old. I recently was lucky enough to be at the Anzac Day service down at Semaphore. There was over 5,000 people there. This is communal identity. This is something that we as Australians and South Australians are proud of. Agreed. And your question, yep. please? My question is, there's a few heritage sites. A lot are being very well dealt with by our present government. The Glenfern National Park is a great win. There are more, though. There's sites we don't hear about. One in particular I'd like to know is Fort Larks. This is an amazing heritage site. It's got military history right back to the start. It's got huge amounts of social potential. And I'm sorry, what I'll ask you again. Here? What is the question? Yep. So my question is, what is happening here? Is this something which will be saved or is there a threat? Can any of the candidates tell me? And are you going to support Fort Largs as being retained as a heritage site? OK. The retention of Fort Largs as a heritage site. Does anybody have an opinion? Sean. Thanks for the question. I actually know that site reasonably well because um, it's the site of the South Australian Police Academy. Um, I certainly support its uh, historic um, preservation and I'm aware that it's currently uh, being considered for, uh, as, to, as to how that will occur. Um, as to the detail and as to the state government's position on it and the local council, I don't have detail, but um, certainly I, I recognise its historical significance and I agree with you that maintaining our, our state heritage and our national heritage and the spaces and the buildings and those places is immensely important. And you know, like everybody here, I was also at Anzac Services um, to commemorate. So okay. whereas we have, I'm sorry, whereas we have had um, interest in giving some of it to the National Trust before, is this something which is still likely to happen? Because it seems to have gone remarkably quiet in the public eye. Can, can I just pull you up there? We've heard the question, and if we can let our panellists answer it, that would be terrific. We do have other people, so I'm just conscious of keeping things moving. Did somebody else want to cut? Steve, please. Just very quickly, uh, uh, it's a very important historical site, and we should be doing all that we can to um, heritage this and save it, etc. It's part of our history. Um, but that, of course, depends on local government and state government. Um, but uh, when you talk about uh, national heritage, uh, under the previous Labor government, there was more uh, national heritage than any other government uh, in, in, in Australia. That's the last um, six years of the Labor government. But that is a real issue, and, and someone like Mark Butler and uh, the other state MPs, Susan Close, I'm sure, are onto it, uh, because it is an important historical site for South Australia, and we should be doing all that we can. We've lost so many buildings um, that are just a magnificent part of our history. Uh, and we should be advocating to save these buildings because once they're gone, they're gone forever. Okay, and I can see that um, Margaret wants to comment. Um, I, I'm not an expert on that issue at all, but it does raise the question about the heritage 
within our seat of Adelaide. And I just want to make a comment about uh, the park lands and how, as you say, what we have. Uh, we can never get more green space in a city like this and there are cities all over the planet jealous of the bones of our city and its lungs and we know more and more about how green space around intensive housing and living and business uh, is going to be incredibly important with changes in temperature and the kind of climate change that we face. So I just want to make a plug for something which I consider such an important part of our city's heritage and that is retaining what we have not having to contest and fight and fight against the encroachment of more cement, more building, more loss of public space. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I know that the clock's ticking, so I'll take a further question over here, please. Uh, Dr. David Faber, Flinders University, resident in the city. Uh, the mayor mentioned the seriousness of the homelessness problem in the city. Uh, what will candidates do to ensure an adequate supply of low-cost housing in the electorate? Okay, who would like to kick that one off? Steve, can I throw it to you at the end? So, so look, it's a big issue, especially in, the, um, in, in this region here in the Adelaide City Council area, plus all over Adelaide. Um, what we've said we'll do is 100,000 new homes uh, in, if, if we're privileged to form government uh, to ease that, uh, that burden because housing is a short, it is a massive shortage of housing. Um, if you're a student, or a, uh, you've got no hope, no hope of securing a house. And uh, we had, we, we, we need to have a housing policy with a housing minister, which we will have. Uh, what we've seen in the past is governments getting rid of housing uh, as part of the, uh, the, the cabinet and ministry and putting it in with other things. I think we need a real focus uh, with a plan to ensure that when people are after rental properties, they are available for them. And building 100,000 new homes will ease, it won't fix the problem, uh, but it'll ease the problem. We know that there's approximately 100,000 people doing it rough every single night around the country that are um, you know, sleeping on people's couches or on the street, uh, and we have to eliminate that. And put the services in place that are required for those people to get back on their feet. Okay, thank you, Steve. Sean, you've got the microphone. Yes, thank you. Um, housing, yes, extremely important. So is getting people into them sustainably. Uh, I spend time, um, a few times a month, um, with our homeless in the city of Adelaide. I see the challenges that they face to transition from genuinely living on the street into boarding houses and then into their own um, standalone property. And the challenge is, is not just physical houses. It's dealing with the reasons that people are out there, the often abuse and mental health issues, um, drug and alcohol dependence, and uh, their history, um, their education, their employability. And it's a broader support service um, question around almost individual mentoring to get people moving forward and, and not not coming back. I've seen people bounce back into uh, rough sleeping and, um, and I've been right at the forefront of um, investigations where people have lost their lives because it's a dangerous world out there um, and people are making choices based on their view of it um, with, with a history of abuse and, and, and difficulties that also need to be challenged. Um, just putting people in houses is not um, a silver bullet solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Barbara? I just want to congratulate the council for giving such emphasis to homelessness and to housing in its uh, ask for in this federal election environment. And you make a, a call for 500,000 uh, accessible, affordable um, uh, community houses. And I think we need to go well beyond 100,000. The Greens policy is for 500,000. We will push hard to get as much public housing as we can because it is the key thing. Alongside what you say, Sean, we do need those services. We need the services that hang with the person, no matter what. But housing is so critical. The Hutt Street Centre tells us this. It shows us that there are, well, we know from recent research, there are very few affordable houses available in our major cities. It drives homelessness and it makes you know, a one-week emergency in someone's life turn into a major disaster because they can't get 
the basic thing they need, which is a, a secure roof over the city. Okay, yep. Further thoughts on um, strategies or policies around reducing homelessness? Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. We need more community housing built. Um, you know, I went I went to Bowdoin the other day, and you know, it's I mean, it looks fantastic. It's all you know, all these new fantastic housing, but it makes you think where the people that were there before, where they've gone, because you know, urban renewal. You know, we build new houses, we knock old ones down, we build new ones, but um, you know, these rents of these new houses are incredibly high. How d how do people go back and afford those houses? You know, so we we definitely need more affordable housing, and it needs to be. Um, a priority of our parliament. To okay, anybody want to make a final comment on this and then I'll move on to the next question? No, we're good? Um, just I'm aware that we've still got people lined up and I'm afraid somebody might miss out. Question over here. Uh, thank you. Um, for the past 25 years, we've, regardless of the employment figures, we've seen wages pretty much being almost stagnant uh, and not increasing much with the economic growth. This has occurred in turn with massive rising inequality between workers and CEOs. Uh, my question to the candidates are, how do we challenge this and help you know, bring wages back up to the growth that we used to see back during the 70s? Okay, so who wants, uh, Steve, you wanna go? How do we support wage growth? Thank you, and uh, we've said we believe in a living wage. Uh, we've seen the lowest wage growth in the history of this nation. Um, profits are going up. The economy uh, is moving upwards. The only thing that's not going upwards is jobs. Uh, sorry, um, wages, they're being driven down. We saw penalty rates uh, through a decision of the Commission taken away, which means that 700,000 workers are um, less better off than they were a few months ago. Uh, we've said that we'll restore those penalty rates. We have moved bills in the Parliament. We've moved legislation in the Parliament seven times seven times the Prime Minister voted against them. Um, and we know that we need a living wage, a wage that gives people the ability to survive, to pay their bills, to send their kids to school, uh, and to do the things that we all take for granted. Um, and as I said, the lowest wage growth in the history of our nation, uh, and uh, no one is really dealing with it at the moment, we need to. If you want to uh, improve the economy, you put $30 in a low, paid income, uh, low income uh, paid person, that $30 will go straight back into the economy, creating the economy. Okay, um, Steve, so the living wage. Deanna, I know you want to comment. Yes, I mean, although we don't have an official position on this, this is something that I um, do believe very passionately about, um, and this is something that I definitely support, because um, one of the things that I think the answer to this is, is more um, focus on small business. Again, having been a small business owner for such a long time myself, one of the things um, that I think gets overlooked is the fact that small businesses are indeed there to nurture their employees. A lot of us are like families. I know that personally I play most of my employees well above their award because they've been with me for a long time and it's based on their performance. But as a small business owner, the lack of support that I've had throughout the 11 years, because sometimes business is good and sometimes it's not, means that it's really hard to be able to continue that growth in the business because when your employees are growing with you as a business and they're there long term, it's best for them, it's best for you and it feeds all round. So that would just be um, a position that I'd personally be supporting, would be a focus on actually nourishing what we've got here um, and helping that to grow. Okay, thank you. And Sean, a final comment. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just aware I've got five minutes left, so I've got room for one last question. So Sean, if you'd like to finish up on this one, please. Certainly. Sorry. Um, supporting business to grow and prosper and succeed and earn and then pass that on to their employees, give, as Deanna's pointed out, employees that are succeeding for a business are invested in. Um, the, the living wage that's been proposed has not been uh, a rate of that has not been uh, announced by Bill Shorten and the Labor team. Where the funding's coming from is, you know, no one knows. The huge impost of uh, further taxes that the, a potential Shorten government has put forward will hurt business and will hurt wage levels and investment in those that pay the bills and pay their employees is the way forward. Uh, and I can tell that, I know you want to respond, Steve, but, but we're not here for a, an, an ongoing debate, and I'd really like to get to our final question for the morning, if you wouldn't mind. Good morning, Thea from the Anti-Poverty Network of South Australia. I'll be very brief. 
we would like to hear briefly from all candidates, what's your commitment to ensuring adequate, appropriate dental care for absolutely every Australian? Uh, dental care, who would like to go? Thank Antonio? you for your question. Um, it's pretty much a no-brainer. Dental care should be part of Medicare anyway, so I'm all for it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, um, uh, we've just announced the dental care uh, package uh, last week where pensioners uh, will be given an amount of money uh, to be able to uh, access uh, services for their teeth. And, and, and pen pensioners are at our one of the, the biggest cohort of people that need constant care, etc. Um, we had a policy where we had uh, services for teenagers and younger people as well. These were scrapped immediately uh, when the Abbott government came in. Um, and, and you're quite right, uh, dental care uh, has been something I've been going on about for a very long time. If you break an arm, which is a bone, you go to the public hospital or to your doctor and they fix it, Medicare pays for it. I know that dental care isn't under Medicare, but a tooth is a bone and it affects your health. It affects um, if you haven't got teeth or if you're having problems with, with your teeth, uh, it'll affect uh, cardiovascular, a uh, whole range of other things. And it's so important that we have the services. And the money put in there so people can access dental services when they require them so they don't deteriorate and then end up in hospitals, etc., and ends up costing the government more. Um, so dental care is a big priority for me. Um, I've been, if you go to my, go to Hansard, you'll see the amount of speeches I've made on dental care over the years. It is a very important health issue. Okay. And I'm very pleased that we announced the, uh, uh, the services for our um, pensioners the other day to be able to access some of those dental services. Okay, thank you. Anybody else commenting on dental care? Ms Barbara. Yes, the, uh, uh, it's just such a wacky thing, isn't it, that our teeth aren't included in our health care system, in our Medicare system. So the Greens have a policy that there should be dental care. You, you should be able to use your Medicare card. We need to change access uh, through the Medicare system to provide dental care. It's vital for so many people. Um, and it's one of the first things you give up if you have, if you have problems with income or, or, and your wages aren't growing. Um, I just want to make one more comment, which is that I think we also need to talk about who influences policy and decision making, including around our health system. It hasn't come up in any questions, but we really need a parliament which makes good decisions for Australian people and, for example, doesn't find a, a great deal of lobbying by the health insurance industry or health interests which don't really pay attention to what people need. And I think that is a factor in why we haven't had the kind of renovation of our Medicare system that we've needed in recent years. Okay, thank you. Final comment? No? Uh, yeah. No, yes. I, th I think um, dental we, we believe dental care should be part of Medicare and it should be available to everyone. Okay, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we will wrap up. Would you please thank our candidates for their attendance this morning? And I'll just remind you that the candidates for the federal seat of Adelaide, in order on the ballot paper, are Chris James of the Australian Democrats, Barbara Pocock from the Greens, Steve Georganis, the Australian Labor Party, Deanna Kangas, Animal Justice Party, Sean Osborne, the Liberal Party, and Antonio Ree, the United Australia Party. Thank them once again. And just a final question, ladies and gentlemen, I'd be intrigued. Um, of those of us who are here this morning, who is still an undecided voter? Show, raise your hands. Who's still undecided? No, it looks like you're all pretty well committed. So thank you all for your attendance. It's been my pleasure to be with you this morning and uh, have a great day. Cheers.